All right, well, welcome uh, to the second, uh, Jonathan, Dr. Lopez's second talk, and welcome to Grand Rounds. So Dr. Lopez is a fairly recent faculty, part of the uh, Pediatric Neurology Program and Pediatric Epilepsy Service at Children's. So Dr. Lopez um, grew up in New York. He went to med school at SUNY Brooklyn, um, and then he's kind of been on the West Coast since then, going to Loma Linda initially for his PEDS training. Um, before moving uh, to Stanford for pediatric neurology and his clinical neurophysiology fellowship. And I guess he wanted to get a deeper experience with epilepsy, so he went to Colorado to do a pediatric epilepsy fellowship um, before joining uh, the Seattle Children's Group in August of last year. So uh, without any further ado, I'll hand it back over to Dr. Lopez. Thanks for agreeing to speak with us. Yeah, thank session. you so much. So I just want to say I am wearing purple today for both Epilepsy Awareness Month and to show where my true allegiances now lie. So. Stroke <laughs> Day. Oh, it is World Stroke Day. That's why. Yeah. Is, is purple though for stroke? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That. That too. That too. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start the, the talk with a controversial term called epilepsy-related sleep disorder. This term doesn't actually exist yet, um, but I am proposing this term to try to put together a topic that is very amorphous and uh, itself very controversial. Um, and I'm going to talk about what happens to children who have epilepsy when they're asleep and what that does to their development. Um, and I think it's appropriate to say, is this the chicken, is this the egg, or is this the EEG? Um, so I'm going to start with a case, um, and then I'll talk about sleep and development in all children, and then what's special about kids with epilepsy in terms of sleep and development. Talk briefly about interictal discharges and development, um, and then I'm going to talk about the ESES CSWS spectrum, and I'll, I'll spell out what those terms mean in a future slide. So I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history, the epidemiology and etiology, definitions, which are themselves controversial in evaluations, pathophysiology and treatments, um, and no fin financial interest or affiliation with commercial uh, or device, commercial pharmaceutical or device entities, but I will be discussing off-label and investigational treatments. I'm going to start with a quote from Hippocrates in The Sacred Disease. I think that this quote, you know, very much uh, embodies uh, the understanding that Hippocrates had that there is some kind of interesting thing that happens during sleep that affects patients with epilepsy. This word mischief, mischief comes from the Greek word kakos or kakon, um, and that's an adjective. Apparently, besides mischief, it can also be interpreted as wicked, evil, vile, wretched, injurious, malicious, mean, foul, rotten, poisoned, ugly, hideous, bad, worthless, useless, unhappy, or low. And the root kak also uh, invokes defecation. So we're going to be talking about that today. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start with the beginning of the case and uh, see if I can hook you guys in. So uh, this is a six-year-old boy. He presents with episodes that his mom describes as he looks dead. Um, he has a diffuse headache and an indescribable psychic sensation. And then he lies limp and pallid on the floor. And he has slurred nonsens nonsensical speech and oral automatisms. Afterwards, he vomits. There's about three or four of these episodes per week. They last about 2 to 20 minutes each, and they're a little hard to figure out onset and offset. There's a past medical history that includes Tourette syndrome and migraine without aura. So epilepsy risk factors, um, birth and neonatal history are essentially unremarkable, though he did have hyperbilirubinemia, needed to have a blood, blood transfusion, so it was pretty significant at two weeks. Shows no other signs of pernicterus, though, at this point. Um, and uh, there is a maternal childhood, uh, maternal history of childhood limited epilepsy and mi migraines, and mom outgrew those, uh, uh, those seizures. So I'm going to talk a little bit about his developmental history in tandem. His gross and fine motor development were normal all along. However, his uh, language and social adaptive skills, he, uh, at age one, 
he was slightly delayed in his language, and I don't have, unfortunately, a lot of details, uh, and he had poor, poor eye contact. Um, at uh, age three, um, he had his first words, which were echo echolalia only and parallel play, and he received an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis, and he began ABA and other therapies. And then at age five, he was still delayed, but he finished the alphabet. He could count to 20, had minimal echolalia, good naming, greater than 1,000 words, and complete sentences. So not a really typical course for a kid with at least typical autism. Um, he was still delayed also in social adaptive skills, but had good engagement with other kids, made eye contact, asked for things by name, and he started gaining urinary continence. Two months after his first definite seizure that we talked about at age six, though, he developed new onset delayed sleep phase and then frequent nocturnal arousals. Mom described uh, a, a very a rapid decline in this kid's development and uh, loss of various skills. She said to me, I'm losing my child. I don't even recognize him. Um, and he, she, she described that he was unable to remember what was said to him even a few minutes later. This is very different than, um, than before the seizure onset. Word finding difficulties that were a little hard to parse out. Um, uh, inattentiveness and hyperactivity that were worse. I, I, I think that he had a little bit of it before the seizure onset, but they clearly worsened. Irritable, he preferred to be alone. He was impulsive, shouting out of turn. He was throwing things and hitting. Uh, had aggressive behavior, defiance, uh, and his mom would say he seems to provoke people on purpose. Um, and he also started to have wor worsened nocturnal aneurysis and now is having nocturnal fecal incontinence as well. Um, he was diagnosed with ADHD and ODD. So we're going to return to that case. Actually, no, nope, we're going to keep going right now. Um, so he had a polysomnography which showed rare central sleep apneas and a he had three routine EEGs which I don't actually have that I have not been able to review myself, but apparently they showed quote unquote risk of seizures coming from the right side of the brain. He started on a low dose of Divalproex. Um, at age seven, he had an IEP that showed average to low average intelligence scores. He was one year behind in all subjects except math, placed in a highly structured classroom. He had a brain MRI, 1.5T, it was normal. And he had a 24-hour video EEG at that, uh, near the time of the IEP. He showed frequent synchronous bifrontal 2 hertz spike wave discharges. There were uh, brief runs, um, but during sleep, these discharges became nearly continuous, taking up greater than 85% of his slow wave sleep. Um, he, and the, interestingly, the overnight EEG showed no seizures, even though he was still having frequent nocturnal arousals. So we will return to that case um, after this brief message. So um, I'm going to talk now about sleep and childhood development. So this is a topic that uh, itself could be 10 lectures. This is a very, very complex topic. And I will just say there are de definitely direct correlations between sleep and neurodevelopment, but we must look at not those two things as a whole, but as their parts. Um, so um, the mechanisms that seem to be shared between these two things, these are, this is sort of small guys, but I hope that you can see it. Genetics, drugs that children are taking, external environments, um, brain structure and networks, both pathologic and normal, medical comorbidities, um, homeostatic mechanisms and imbalances and inflammation can uh, definitely um, affect both neurodevelopment and learning. And the same, for example, genetic abnormality could affect both. Um, and this, you're going to see this diagram about to get extremely complicated. Um, and you see that there are many things that can be measured by the neuropsychologists that were previously defined only as a standardized score. The problem is more recently has been recognized in the DSM-5 that talking about quote unquote intellectual disability really requires a determination of disability, not just a standardized score. Um, so that doesn't really account for environmental supports and resiliencies. So now the requirement is uh, low IQ plus um, a requirement for external support, and it's the degree of external support that seems to be most important, and that's what some of these bottom circles, you know, get at. Um, and it's rare that a single variable in sleep is affected as well. So you have various types of movement, the sort of sleep-related movement, sleep-related breathing, 
um, REM parasomnias, non-REM parasomnias. Um, you, you have abnormalities of sleep structure, duration, um, the practices, you know, that, that, that um, I, I, I would say there's a broad thing, a, a, a broad um, group of practices that could be potentially problematic in a family um, around sleep and circadian rhythms, which can be different um, across the age spectrum um, and with many other variables. So you can see, obviously, this is an extremely complex slide, but there are, there are complex interactions between both sleep and, uh, and neurodevelopment. So uh, what does the research show us about children who get good sleep versus children who don't get as good sleep? And I will say that the best research available um, are still, you know, mostly association studies. There are very few clinical trials that really show these things very well. Um, but you seem to have less somnolence in those kids, which seems to make sense. They get better sleep. Um, they are less obese, um, and that could be a two-way, you know, effect. Um, they seem to have more attention and creativity and reasoning, higher level executive functioning, overall quality of life and learning um, seem to be better. And this seems to make sense with a good night's sleep. Um, less good um, uh, evidence shows that they're less likely to become ill, that if they're teenagers, they're less likely to commit suicide. Um, they have decreased car accidents and generally accidental injuries, better mood, uh, better school performance, and then really not so good research uh, with very weak associations include, you know, less risk taking, less oppositional behavior, improved working memory, improved behavioral rec uh, regulation, and improved intelligence. Um, so this is uh, just looking at all children. Now what about children with epilepsy? 50 to 80 percent of children with epilepsy have an objective or sleep study or subjective as in survey evidence of a sleep disorder. Um, that's a huge number and that's definitely far outweighs the general population. Um, I believe those estimates are more in the 10 to 20 percent range. Um, so uh, the most common source for um, our epilepsy, you know, what, what are the effects uh, of sleep in children with epilepsy are association studies. There are a few trials that have been done, for example, with melatonin or tonsilloadenoidectomy or CPAP. Um, and survey data and objective sleep measures seem to come to the same conclusions that are listed here. But when they do direct neuropsychological evaluations and trials, there's a lot more conflicting data. Um, so like the other kids, decreased somnolence. Um, they seem to have uh, less oppositional behavior and hyperactivity. They actually seem to have a higher IQ. Of course, is that cause or effect or both? Um, their language is better. Verbal memory is better. Processing speed, attention, um, and uh, mood. And they report an improved quality of life. What about seizure fa uh, direct uh, factors related to the epilepsy itself and seizures? Um, so as it turns out, uh, as would be expected, the severity of the epilepsy seems less, and the frequency of seizures, uh, are, the, the seizures are less often, um, and they, are, they seem to be on fewer medications. They also seem to be more responsive to medications, and uh, they have not burned through a whole bunch of medications if they're sleeping better. Um, the, there are definitely a lot of confounds in this population, and seizure frequency and number of medications, IQ, <coughs> and psychiatric milieu seem to have a substantial effect on the relationship between the sleep and the other variables. Those seem to be the key gateway variables for these kids. Um, so, um, so now that we sort of talked about the relationship between neurodevelopment and learning and sleep, and we talked about it in kids with epilepsy, we now have to account for a third problem in this, in this diagram, and it's about to become really complicated. Um, in the middle of the diagram, we still have all the same factors that seem to affect neurodevelopment and learning and also sleep, but they seem to affect the epilepsy as well um, and, and be affected by the epilepsy. So I, I threw all those same bullets in there so you don't have to read them again, but those all you know, are factors that are interacting in this three-way diagram. But what about the epilepsy-specific factors? So epilepsy comorbidities, um, the uh, seizures while awake, seizures during sleep, um, how are those going to influence sleep, the postictal state, and epileptiform abnormalities while awake. Of all of those, I'm probably just going to address for the most part the epileptiform abnormalities while awake, but the thing that I'm going to try to focus the most on in this talk is just the corner of this very large slide, which is epileptiform abnormalities during sleep. 
And I, you can already tell that um, it's very hard to focus on one of these factors and keep hold all other factors the same and say that there is truly a causal relationship. But we're going to do our best. So what about interictal discharges and development? In healthy children, about 0.7 to 5% of those children um, will have uh, bona fide epileptiform discharges. 50% Fif uh, of, the, of the children who have discharges will have behavioral or neurodevelopmental disturbances, which makes you wonder how did they identify them as healthy children? Are these major disturbances? Um, and in follow-up, about 12% of those will have at least one afebrile seizure and 5% will develop epilepsy, but still a small minority of the total group of those with interictal discharges. So what about children with ADHD? Um, depending on how you do the study, whether it's a routine or an overnight study, you'd see anywhere between 5 and 49%. Um, and of course, between all of these studies, what they define as epileptiform is different, whether they use photic stimulation, et cetera. Um, but they seem to see that the children that, um, who, uh, who have more epileptiform discharges have in increased tendency towards impulsivity. Um, and in follow-up, about 3% 3, 3 of those had at least one afebrile seizure of those, all those who had epileptiform abnormalities, so less than the healthy children group, which is sort of interesting to me. Um, what about children with an autism spectrum disorder, that's ASD? Um, roughly similar numbers, um, and again, those epileptiform discharges really seem to be associated with aggression, and the more intellectually disabled the child with autism spectrum disorder, the more likely they are to also have epileptiform discharges, or is it the other way around? Um, the best available data on those children are 24-hour EEGs that are done from, there was a, a group in the Chicago, in Chicago Medical School that really showed no association between regression and epileptiform EEGs, which is uh, a damning blow against what we're going to talk about or not. Um, so um, what about people who, uh, who have epilepsy? What do the epileptiform discharges do? So increased rate of discharges is associated with decreased overall neuropsychological and academic performance. Um, <clears throat> so um, when they looked at various uh, neuropsychological functions, there are two studies that were done out of King's College in London, and there were dominant side discharges that were associated with loss of verbal memory during a verbal memory task and non-dominant discharges that were associated with not forming short-term memory for non-verbal non uh, memory tasks. Um, and in that group, they bought out two cases that had good seizure control and frequent discharges that were significantly affecting cognitive function, whatever that means. Um, they started an additional anti-seizure medicine and subsequent routine EEGs showed a reduction of discharges and the patients reported improvement in cognitive function. Um, so there are other groups that have looked at not just lateralization dependence, but time dependence. So King's College group again, Dartmouth, um, also looked at um, uh, the, the time dependence. When does the, if there's a spike that happens during a memory task at some point, um, does that actually influence the timing of the spike and the timing of the encoding of the task versus the retrieval and the maintenance? Does that have any effect? Um, and they found uh, that, uh, that uh, in the retrieval phase, that seemed to be the most consistent finding from study to study. They seemed to say different things, but there did seem to be a time dependence. Um, in UCLA and, and in Netherlands, um, they had similar findings of uh, perception and processing speed. Um, so down in UCLA, is it Schumann? Schumann and Irwin? Um, discharges in areas involved in visual perception especially those discharges that were high amplitude and broad field in the contralateral visual field, impaired performance on visual tasks. Um, and uh, those seem to also be time dependent and, as I said, burden dependent. Um, so um, there are um, specific, uh, hang on one second, sorry. So it seems like there's a bidirectional relationship between physiologic network oscillations and spikes. Um, and, um, uh, and, and it seems to be a complex one. The group that's probably studied this the most is Mayo. Um, and they showed that successful visual encoding, for example, decreased the spectral power 
of low and high frequency bands of this is you know uh, physiologic oscillations and that they had less spikes when they had a successful visual encoding uh, when they successfully completed a visual encoding task unsuccessful encoding on the other hand decreased the power of the low frequency band increased the power of the high frequency band and there was a maintenance or increase in spike rates um, and there was a burst of increased power in all bands right before the spike. So is this the basis, for example, for reflex epilepsies, like photosensitive epilepsies? Um, uh, is it the basis for potentially even cortical release phenomena in epilepsy? This really isn't well known. But that's, that, was one of the, that was one of the major points that the authors were trying to make. So you have a very complex you know, relationship even in the awake state. So what about in the long term? Those are just short-term tasks. What about children with epilepsy? So um, in self-limited focal epilepsy syndromes, um, the, you know, probably the, the classic one being benign relandic epilepsy, it seems to be um, that uh, there's an association with increased spiking over time and increased difficulties in reading and writing, verbal memory, academic performance, and even family maladjustment. What about in self-limited generalized epilepsy syndromes like childhood absence epilepsy? Um, some similar problems um, that seemed to exist at least in childhood, but these children were not studied long term after the seizures and the discharges seemed to reduce or go away. Um, so what we do know is that the psychosocial outcomes for those children are not what we used to think that they were, that they, even children with childhood absence epilepsy, um, really um, have a lot more psychosocial difficulties than other kids who had chronic illnesses, even uh, limited to childhood. Um, so uh, some found that the change in spike rate over time was associated with fluctuation or change in the severity of deficits, but even that wasn't a consistent finding. So on the background of that, I want to talk about ESES and CSWS. So all of the words that are used in these um, in these acronyms are down there in the, in the bottom left corner. And I left them that way because nobody can really agree even on what the letters mean. So this is an epileptic encephalopathy that includes electrographic or electrical status epilepticus. It seems to be continuous or not with spike waves or not with during slow wave sleep and or other you know, epochs of sleep. But it does seem to happen in sleep and it does seem to be some kind of a syndrome. <laughs> Um, so, um, so those are, um, uh, those are uh, the various definitions that have been used over time. So just a brief history, um, actually, you know what, I am going to, I'm, this is going to be very sad, but I'm going to skip through the history which includes Lennox and Gesto um, and Landau and Kleffner um, who originally described what would probably be the first recognized form of CSWS, uh, uh, landau kleffner syndrome. Um, and this is uh, Carlo Tassinari, who in the 70s published on a cohort of children with quote unquote sleep related subclinical electrical status epilepticus. This was spike waves occurring mostly during sleep. Later on, he proposed the term electrical status epilepticus during sleep, and then others tried to change it to encephalopathy with status epilepticus during sleep. And then the ILAE got a hold of it and it became a big mess. Um, so, um, this guy, Olivier Duloc, really, I think, helped to crystallize the concept of a larger concept and the framework within which uh, this disorder um, falls, which is epileptic encephalopathies. So most agree that it's a type of epilepsy syndrome that involves sleep, and this month the ILAE updated their classification system for status epilepticus. They actually included the epileptic encephalopathies in that system, but they said they're quote unquote currently indeterminate conditions or boundary syndromes. So they think maybe that status epilepticus and these uh, encephalopathies, that there is some overlap in, um, in what's happening. So um, there's been a, you know, a long running debate now, certainly longer than I've been an epileptologist about uh, um, is there truly something that's an ep epileptic encephalopathy, or should we just be calling it generally encephalopathy that occurs in epilepsy? Um, so in 2010, the commission did agree that epileptic encephalopathy should be a term that we should use. This is a commission that gets together and talk about terminology. And so they defined it as an electroclinical syndrome, specified or unspecified, that's associated with a high probability of failure to develop as expected relative to same age peers or regression and abilities, 
and that presents or worsens after the onset of epilepsy. Um, furthermore, they said that this doesn't even imply that there's actually a sentence in there that says, encephalopathy does not imply that all individuals with these disorders will appear encephalopathic. Um, so, <laughs> um, clearly when we are redefining sort of a term that's, you know, one of the basic terms of neurology, you know, we're going to uh, encounter some problems. But I think this does also speak to when you're talking about a developmental encephalopathy in children, um, we're talking about one part or multiple networks within the brain that are affected and either cause a slowing or a regression. Um, then the 2001 commission was even worse, but they did try to say that the epileptic activity itself may contribute to severe cognitive or behavioral impairments um, above and beyond what might be expected from the underlying pathology alone, as well as the fact that those impairments can actually worsen over time. So the 2010 commission didn't even admit that it was the activity itself, but they said it's kind of associated with the onset of epilepsy. So when we talk about these various epilepsy syndromes, and we talk about the epileptic encephalopathies, we can talk about them as a whole, but there are many epilepsy syndromes within that. And this ESES, CSWS spectrum exists within those, with, entirely within that epileptic encephalopathies. This first described Landau-Kleffner syndrome, which was renamed acquired aphasia and epilepsy, and about 10 other things, um, also, I, I believe, fits entirely within the ESES CSWS spectrum. Um, so that all kids with Landau-Kleffner syndrome also have ESES and CSWS, but not the other way around. So where does this fit in the larger classification of epilepsies? Well, there's a lot of overlap between what we call the genetic generalized epilepsies and the childhood self-limited epilepsy syndromes that are associated with focal seizures like benign Rolandic epilepsy or occipital epilepsy of childhood. Um, and these, those overlap with each other, but they also overlap probably with ESES, and then they also overlap with this very specific phenotype, or what used to be a specific phenotype of landau kleffner syndrome. So when I didn't, I didn't go through the history, but in the history it became apparent that what landau and kleffner had described was one type of CSWS, and people kept trying to slightly expand it until they realized that there was a lot more than just discharges going on in one side in the centrotemporal um, uh, cortex. And that is really what gave way to ESES and CSWS as a, you know, um, as a, uh, as a terminology. Um, so pediatric neurology practices, uh, it would be extremely rare to see these kids, of course. Um, we don't always check overnight EEGs in all kids, which is one of our biases. Um, certainly though, in, in tertiary pediatric epilepsy centers, we have no problem ordering 24-hour EEGs when you know, kids look sideways uh, once. But uh, 0.5 to 0.6% of all patients with epilepsy and 2% of those undergoing epilepsy surgery um, are uh, meet criteria for, or at least someone's criteria for ESES and CSWS. And there seems to be a slight male uh, uh, preponderance. So hence the, you know, the, the one red flower and all the purple ones. Um, so, um, uh, so what about the etiology? The etiology really seems to be uh, to vary quite a bit um, from series to series, but across series if you put them all together about, you know, somewhere about around half seem to have a genetic etiology. Um, and the first studies, well, all we could get is that there was a family history of epilepsy in about 15% of the entire group. Um, more recent studies, though, including Heather Mefford's group here, have showed um, associations with copy number variations. And it seems to be that most of those copy number variations, or a large proportion of them, are in cell adhesion proteins. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. Um, and very recently, in the last year, it's been discovered that uh, GRIND2A uh, uh, gene uh, mutations uh, seem to be overrepresented in this, in particular, in the CSWS ESES cohort, where they don't seem to be represented in the group with "quote unquote" benign Rolandic epilepsy or other epileptic encephalopathies, suggesting that there might be a specific role for this protein in sleep-related um, spiking and discharges. Um, then the structural epilepsy, uh, structural causes, uh, again, roughly around 50%, maybe a little more than the genetics. Um, it seems to be that about 10 to 30 percent of the cases are related to perinatal vascular events, which I found very interesting, and especially those involving the reticular nucleus of the thalamus. Um, 
cortical malformations and shunted hydrocephalus also are represented in these uh, in, in most series. Very rare to see um, diagnosed metabolic or mitochondrial uh, disease. The one that's been case that's been described that I could find talked about a complex one deficiency. Um, okay, so we've tried to define it, um, but how do we actually measure it? Um, so um, I think you know my colleagues and I would all basically say at this point we have no idea. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is to tell you what has been discussed in the literature at this point as and what has been proposed. And a lot of it is the same as the ways that we would try to assess children with this larger group of quote unquote epileptic encephalopathies. So um, we try to uh, you know, classify the impairment. Is it global and diffuse or is it localized? If it's localized, does it fit within a particular network that we would expect to fit in or a particular node? Um, and does it seem to correlate with what we see as a structural abnormality on the, on the MRI? Does it seem to correlate with what we see as the EEG abnormality? Um, and or is it just an abnormality that seems to have been identified you know, um, by a parent or a clinician? Um, so uh, what about the dynamics? Um, people argue that there's, this must be an age-limited syndrome. We really think that this syndrome is, is limited to childhood and maybe early teens. There are very few clinicians out there, at least when they did surveys of the clinicians about what is this condition and what ages does it present. There's very few that believe that it persists or initiates beyond age 12. Um, so, um, um, so I want to talk a little bit about the, you know, the different courses that you can see in these children. So um, in classic Landau-Kleffner syndrome, there was no personal antecedent, uh, antecedent sorry. Um, and there were three stages, and in the acute phase, you'd have over weeks, a four-year-old would develop focal seizures. They'd be infrequent, they'd be easy to control with medications. Then there'd be a deterioration of language recognition and speech production, and the EEG would show ESES or CSWS with unilateral broad field discharges and a centrotemporal maximum. And then there was a second stage, it was a chronic phase where you'd have stable deficits essentially for about four years. Then if you did an EEG at the end of that time, you'd see that the ESES was improving. And stage three was the residual phase where they'd start to recover some language recognition in production, um, but there'd usually be a mild residual impairment. And then they could stop anticonvulsants um, without seizure remission and the EEG would normalize. So that's supposed to be what was classical Landau-Kleffner syndrome. And then the spectrum started expanding. And then people talked about what they thought, at least Tassinari thought, was classical CSWS, which was similar, although there was often a delayed appearance of neuropsychological effects and ESES by up to two or three years after seizure onset rather than the concurrent onset. Um, and um, the, the onset of ESES seemed to be associated with increased so seizure frequency and types and a tendency towards generalization, to which I would say the seizures increased in frequency, therefore we did the 24-hour EEG. So I don't know that I could say that that's a directional relationship um, as confidently as the authors have. And the spectrum has been significantly widening since then, both for clinical and EEG assessments. Um, so in terms of a clinical course, you know, classically we had to see regression and loss of skills but really what we are seeing now, if we are including all of these kids in our, in our definition, is that on the one end of the spectrum, you seem to see a waxing and waning course. You might see a kid that has a severe deficit, and then they seem to spontaneously improve. And then a couple of months later, a severe deficit, and they improve again. Then we see these kids that just start to have a deceleration. Um, they kind of fall off the curve with their peers. We see kids that have a stagnation, that not only do they fall off the curve, they just don't actually gain any new skills. Let me see these kids that have this stuttering kind of stepwise or continuous loss of skills. Um, and that's kind of the, the classic group that's described. And then we have this group that's failure. They, they, they're similar to that stagnation group, but they never actually developed any skills in one area, such as language, um, that we can detect anyway. Um, what about personal antecedents? So, antecedents? so people have argued that you have to have a totally normal MRI and no antecedents. But again, are we widening the spectrum here to include acquired injury? Um, do they have to have a visible lesion or not? Um, do they have to be 
have no abnormality identified on genetics. Um, and what people have kind of come up with, as they've said, like the definition for epileptic encephalopathies, it has to be, if they have any of these things identified, it doesn't seem to account for the degree of localization, uh, the degree or the localization of the deficits. So um, if you have nonverbal learning difficulties in somebody who you expect, you know, uh, would not have it because they have a left temporal lesion, you know, or a left frontal lesion, um, is this uh, involvement over broader networks than would be expected for the pathology? Um, so they also, some people propose that you can really not meet criteria for another self-limited epilepsy syndrome or a self-limited epilepsy syndrome like Bernan-Merlandic epilepsy. Um, and some people argue that you have to have good seizure control because if you don't have good seizure control, how do you know what the contribution of the nighttime EEG is to all of this? Um, so um, how do we even go about, if those are the things we're looking for, how do we actually go about you know, assessing them? Well, we do our structured evaluations. Some of them are clinic-based, um, and some of them are more based on inventories or checklists or questionnaires, at least in studies. There are no groups that really have described their practical clinical experience with these things. These are all sort of research-based um, uh, evaluations. Um, unstructured evaluations, observation during the clinic is probably one of our most important tools in pediatric neurology um, and looking at um, uh, the way that kids play. The gestalt, which is probably the most often cited feature of, you know, I think they got worse, I think they got better um, in even, you know, in, in, in the largest studies basically in CSWS and ESES. Um, so do we believe the report of the parent? Are there some cases where we can believe the report of the patient if they're able to seemingly report it? And what domains do we look at? So instead of just looking at expressive language, now we've started to, to broaden sort of the domains that we look at such that essentially we're looking at every domain of neuropsychological development in kids. Um, and it seems that there's, for every domain, there's at least five or six cases that are reported to specifically affect that domain there still seems to be a preponderance of kids that have um, executive function and um, uh, an expressive language dysfunction. Um, so what about the EEG? So that's the clinical stuff is a total mess. But what about the EEG? That probably, surely that's going to be a lot clearer. No. So um, some people believe that when we look at ESES, we should only be looking at one epoch. Some, uh, epoch. some people believe we should be looking at two or more. Some people think it really has to be the entire nocturnal sleep. Other people say, well, at least one sleep-wake cycle. And then somebody else says, no, it really should be non-REM sleep, and it should be the whole night, all non-REM sleep, uh, look, look at all of it. Some people say first five to ten minutes, it's, you know, first sleep cycle. No, it's not all non-REM sleep, it's only slow-wave sleep. And there's a study, there's at least one or two studies that have used every single one of these different criteria. Um, so can we really compare those? Hard to know. Um, so um, uh, other people will say, should we actually compare the sleep to wakefulness? What if they're continuously spiking in wakefulness? Does it really make sense to look at their spiking during the nighttime? And if it does, how much should we be comparing? How much of a difference should there be between wakefulness and sleep before we can truly call this a sleep-related encephalopathy? Um, so then people talk about, all right, now that we, none of us agree on which epic we're going to measure, at least we can agree on how much of that epic needs to be affected. So you have studies that say gestalt of significant sleep activation. You have studies that say more than 25% of whatever epic I looked at, more than 50, more than 60, more than 85. Probably the most agreed upon criteria are greater than 85 and greater than 50. <laughs> um, and uh, some people would even go as far as to say that it's required, you know, some, some, uh, most people would say it's required if you're going to call it CSDFWS that it has to be meet some of those criteria. Versus some people would say, I included the kids in the study because they seemed to have a little activation during sleep and I just, I thought that it really seemed like the clinical picture fit. You know, so they just said it's, it's not required but it's typical. Um, so things that people haven't looked at as consistently is the distribution and the lateralization. You know, so in LKS, they originally described kids that had centrotemporal spikes, but then later on people described bisynchronous spikes, and people even described contralateral spikes to what was the expected deficit. Um, so uh, um, really paying attention in your studies to, is, are all the children with left 
hemisphere spikes supposed to be included in one group, all the children with right hemisphere spikes supposed to be included in another. We don't know what we think we should because we can look at those sorts of things. Amplitude, is the amplitude of the, the, of the spikes important at all? Is the morphology, spike versus spike wave, you know, versus sharp, sharp wave, poly spike, um, does that matter? Um, the measure that's used, even when you've agreed that, all right, we're all going to use 85% in the first epoch in the first five minutes of slow wave sleep, you know, which measure should we use? Uh, spike frequency, automated quantification, um, and spike wave index. These are all different ways that authors have proposed. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of details about So how many epileptologists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is it depends on what you mean by light bulb. So um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the other assessments that are done for kids with uh, ESCS and CSWS, except to say that most of them are in the research arena at this point trying to prove that where is the localization, where is the lesion. Um, and uh, the studies, especially looking at sort of functional MRI and PET and SPECT and you know, metabolism are all over the map, um, just as the EEG findings are. Um, so Peter Kolros here and others have found changes to evoke potentials. Um, and those seem to be concordant with the expected location of the deficits. Where measured, they also seem to be correlated with EEG abnormalities. Um, so studies of CSF on children with Landau-Kleffner showed normal findings, as did resection of normal tissue. But there have been serum studies, which we're going to talk just a little bit about um, as far as uh, etiology is concerned. So, uh, so now moving into pathophysiology, there are two things that I really want to talk about. So what actually causes the EEG to activate in a specific way? And if we're talking about slow wave sleep um, being the most important part of sleep where they tend to activate the most and we think that they're doing the most damage, um, why is that happening? And then why does the patient become encephalopathic? Is it due to that or is it due to something else? Um, so um, looking at sort of some of the mechanisms um, uh, some of the antecedent, uh, antecedents, sorry, I keep saying it, we're wrong, um, um, include the genetics uh, of these, um, genetics of fairly well-defined populations that fit either into LKS or uh, ESCS, um, um, CSWS. Uh, one of them is the elong elongator protein complex 4. Polymorphisms in this gene could predispose to both spikes and impairment of elongation-mediated interaction of genes. And that, that particular interaction is imp uh, implicated in brain development. Again, I've, a lot of the details I don't have here. But um, building on the work of Heather Mefford, uh, other groups have found uh, cell adhesion proteins seem to be important. Uh, grind 2 a um, which is glutamate receptor ionotropic NMDA2A, um, these are probably both important um, at the synapse. I mean, these are definitely important at the synapse, but they're, they're probably also important for um, inflammation and regulation of inflammation in the CNS. Um, and so one of the other mechanisms that seems to have been proposed is, is it a vasculopathy or vasculitis? And Kate can tell us always which one it is. It must be one or the other. Um, and <laughs> Um, alongside that, although slightly different, autoimmunity and infection um, are other proposed mechanisms um, that could cause both. Um, what about early developmental lesions? We talked about that in the thalamus, um, that, um, that there was an overwhelming representation of patients who seemed to have lesions in the thalamus that had CSWS, and among the CSWS cohort, there seemed to be among the lesional uh, patients, there seemed to be an overrepresentation in the thalamus. Um, I'm going to skip over this one for now. Um, so, probably one of the, the bigger controversies is is really epilepsy the cause and contributor to the abnormalities that we see in development, or is it a bystander? And is it the etiology? You know, and so, or, or is it uh, the EEG and epilepsy sort of a biomarker, or is it just an epiphenomenon? Um, so I'm going to walk through a few of those arguments just very briefly, um, and I'll say, you know, intermediate evidence, not good, not great, um, that it is a cause includes long-term studies that, uh, of children with ESES that show some relationship, but the most consistent findings are that onset of seizures and ESES, which is usually caught incidentally, up to one year before 
um, but almost never after the recognized neurodevelopmental changes might indicate that if the EEG changes are preceding the developmental changes that they play a role. Um, clinical improvement likewise lags weeks or months behind the EEG improvement when you treat these kids or when they spontaneously improve. Um, and there are definitely a lot of biases, you know, in that type of research, which I'm not even going to go into now, but if you're interested, we can talk more about. Um, and um, so uh, what, what other sort of reason do we have to believe maybe that epilepsy is actually causing the, uh, these deficits? So we have to look to other epileptic encephalopathies, West syndrome. The outcome in West syndrome is most dependent on abolishing the hips arrhythmia. Um, and it seems to be that the earlier the treatment, the more likely that you will have a, a better or normal neurodevelopmental outcome. Um, and um, what about epilepsy surgery? It seems that improved global outcome occurs even when seizures are infrequent and the resections seem to be more focal. So that suggests that if you have a global outcome or an, an improvement in global cognition or areas that are distant from the site, but it seems like there are larger network effects going on. Um, and models of non-convulsive status epilepticus in rats seem to also um, support uh, this relationship. So what about um, uh, studies that seem to support that it's a biomarker or an epiphenomenon? Um, so the short-term studies, we talked about long-term studies before, the short-term short studies that just look at an EEG and look at a clinical assessment um, seem to show um, no relationship at all. Um, so uh, what about, um, you know, the etiology? Um, I'd say the etiology is always the, the prevailing counter-argument anytime somebody brings up that epilepsy, you know, or EEG or spiking is the cause, you know, of, of, of anything in epilepsy, essentially. Um, so, um, there are a couple of examples that I can think of, again, that go against that, but for, uh, for time reasons, I'm going to skip over that. What about hyperexcitability? We know that children go through a certain developmental stage. We think that, you know, because of uh, maturational changes that happen to various receptors, including to the NMDA receptor in GRIND2A, um, that uh, there's a, there's, this syndrome seems to be age-limited because of those maturational changes that happen. Um, what about hijacked sleep machinery? There's a lot that I could talk about here, but suffice it to say, you notice that there are, um, uh, the machinery that's involved in uh, producing sleep spindles seems to also uh, be able to produce spike wave discharges, particularly thal thalamo thalamocortical loops. Um, and I'm going to skip over this. So um, just wanted to talk a little bit about treatment. Um, so um, there's definitely a lot of literature on LKS and particular developmental interventions that are done for LKS um, that seem to um, really uh, substantially improve the language uh, outcome. The issue is if you just give a kid a medication, try to get the pattern to resolve, but you don't actually rehabilitate them, they won't improve. Um, suffice it to say that there is less good data in, um, in functional and uh, rehabilitation interventions for kids in the broader spectrum of CSWS and ESES. So what about pharmacological invent, uh, interventions? Uh, the long and the short of it, um, there was a meta-analysis very recently that looked at 112 articles covering nine, uh, 950 treatments, 575 patients. These are still relatively small numbers. And the endpoint was any EEG or cognitive improvement. So any of those things we talked about. Um, and it seemed to be that steroids had a much better outcome than any of the other um, interventions that were tried as far as pharmacologic interventions. But among the other ones that are more often tried, high-dose diazepam is uh, very popular. Um, but our typical anti-epileptics have been used definitely successfully in case reports and small case series. Um, and uh, what about uh, mood, behavior, and attention? You know, can we directly address those apart from the addressing the epilepsy? And it really seems people don't have a lot of good experience with that. They try it, it doesn't seem to work. Um, what about non-pharmacologic interventions? Very small numbers for ketogenic diet and VNS showing some improvement. Um, a lot of different surgeries have been proposed, but these are usually in the context of patients who have medically intractable clinical seizures. Um, 
And what about time? You know, does, uh, we, we know that this, you know, in some of these kids or a lot of these kids that seem this uh, epilepsy and the neurodevelopmental issues seem to at least improve or resolve. So when we look at any of our other interventions, if we don't have a control group, how do we know that it wasn't just time that improved um, these kids? We do know when we look at these kids basically as a whole, no matter what intervention we use, that they do seem to lose a lot of IQ points. And then, you know, if we, if we measure them longitudinally, they may gain some back, but it's pretty rare that they would actually gain back to the level that they were before. Um, so back to discussing our case, we tried a whole bunch of different interventions for this kid, which really didn't seem to improve things at all. Um, this was actually before he came to see me. Um, when I first saw him, I increased his Depakote and it reduced the seizures, but didn't seem to really affect anything else. Um, he had uh, diffuse deficits. Um, he was at a two to three year old level for social skills and about one to two years, uh, sorry, two to three years behind in all other skills. Um, didn't really seem to have any regression by history per se, but seemed to really just have stagnated development around the time of the seizure onset. So when we got an EEG, it showed bifrontal spike wave discharges that were occasional during wakefulness. And then during sleep, he had this pattern, and this is the pattern of ESES, continuous spike wave discharges, left over right, left over right. Um, not that it really matters. You could flip this around and it would look the same way. Um, but uh, we saw this only during slow wave sleep. Um, so we started him on a course of prednisolone, steroids seeming to be, you know, the best pharmacologic treatment, and uh, seizures initially started improving. Um, we started reducing the prednisolone, and some of the behavior problems recurred, but he had preserved language gains. We went back up on the prednisolone for a couple of weeks and started amantadine. As behavior improved, he was still somewhat some, uh, impulsive, and he still had some issues with sleep. Um, then we started weaning the prednisolone again, and uh, his behavior, you know, seemed to be unchanged, um, at least uh, before the daily dose of amantadine, but afterwards his behavior seemed improved. Um, month three through six, we tapered the prednisolone off, stopped clon uh, uh, clonidine, and continued him on amantadine a twice a day dosing. His behavior then went back to pre-morbid baseline. He continued to make developmental gains, and as EEG was essentially normal during wakefulness with rare spikes during sleep. Um, so I just called his mom a couple of days ago. Um, he's still on amantadine. We switched his valproic acid over to topiramate for headache control. Um, and um, he stopped uh, the dexmethylphenidate that he had been taking for um, quote unquote ADHD. Mom says to me, I cry when I think about how he was. He's now like a totally normal eight year old boy, seizure free, headache free. Um, his IEP shows that he's progressed you know, from kindergarten to late second grade level, he's almost caught up to his colleagues. Uh, no behavior problems at school, and he sleeps well through the night and has no aneurysis. Um, so mom's looking forward to trying to take him off of the medicine. So the question is, in this child, was it amantadine? Was it steroids with a delayed effect? Was it Depakote somehow with valproic acid with a delayed effect? Um, or was it just time? You know, did, that, did he improve just uh, like that? So I'm sorry, guys, that I went a little bit long, but thank you for your patience and listening to me. So, so at least in um, adults with focal epilepsy, there's some suggestion that some localizations are more likely to produce seizures during sleep, um, specifically parietal and Seizure. I guess in some of these cases, they're maybe not even diagnosed with epilepsy before they have ESES identified. But is there any association with a localization or in most of these cases suspected focal epilepsy? So the, the question was regarding, you know, it seems in adults that there is some association with either, you know, increased interictal spike frequency or even seizures with specific localizations, especially frontal or parietal. Is there a suggestion that ESES is also, you know, localization related? I would say it's probably not by accident that the LKS kids were discovered first. Um, there's still a fairly large representation of those kids. There's probably something special about the periorolandic cortex that makes it particularly likely to activate during sleep, become bisynchronous, um, and um, I would say 
you know, that, that gets into the borderland of one of the more common epilepsy syndromes of benign malignant epilepsy, which itself, because it's so common, I would say, might be the reason why we're seeing that more often um, and seeing that represented more often. Beyond that, the second most common pattern that, that's been described is generalized or apparently generalized. So. It's a very good question. So I, I started Amantadine on the basis of basically about 20 case reports um, and not such great literature. Um, because as he was coming down on the prednisolone, his behavior was getting a lot worse. And because he'd had a rash with Risperdone and he had already tried dexmethylphenidate, this was essentially a bit of a flail, you know, to say, can we try to get the behavior under control? Those who have tried Amantadine have said they thought that it really improved the spike wave index itself, but it was almost always tried as steroids were being weaned in the same way that I've done it. So I wonder if the amantadine seemed to be having a more of a primary behavioral effect than actually affecting the ESES because it was gone by that point. Um, even more supportive of that is when we moved some of the dose to the morning, it improved its whole day time as opposed to when the dose was in the afternoon, it only approved the evening behavior. So. As far as amantadine, God only knows. <laughs> if anybody else actually knows how amantadine works in the, in the CNS, supposedly there's NMDA and AMPA receptor modulation, um, but from my understanding, it's a pretty dirty drug there as well. So I didn't have a chance to go through a lot of the mechanisms, but one of the important things is NMDA-mediated synaptic um, expansion and synaptic pruning. And... Uh, as far as the excitatory synapses, you know, in NMDA, the thought is that within, you know, that NMDA, abnormal, immature NMDA receptors promote um, synchronization and bisynchrony pathologically. And so if you block that, block that immature NMDA, or if you block the NMDA receptors, the thought is that at least you could make it focal or you could localize it, you know, the discharge to one, one location. But those papers and those case reports don't even really, none of them, as far as I'm concerned, really give an adequate explanation for why that might happen. But as my understanding is, amantadine has been used for just about everything in neurology. <laughs> so. Just from a simple practical standpoint, if you have a child with epilepsy who has specific challenges, like language challenges, what would be your threshold for getting an open IV? It's a very good question. I would say, um, when I, you know, one way that we sometimes identify these kids um, is they fall asleep on a routine EEG and they suddenly become continuous. Um, you know, some of those kids, though, you have to be careful there because benign relentic epilepsy can also significantly activate for the first portion of sleep and then it gets better. Um, kids who have just a, an unexplained regression. Um, at least at this center, we tend to not just admit them for a 24-hour EEG. There are centers that seem to admit all of those kids. And I can tell you from my experience at Colorado Children's, it's a very, very low yield. Um, so kids who have epilepsy, um, in particular, if the epilepsy seems to worsen, the seizures worsen as the development gets worse, or if the seizures you know, are under control and it seems the development is clearly stagnating or getting worse over time, those are ones where I would say most of us would get that overnight 24-hour EEG. We also identify a lot of these kids incidentally. We're trying to classify their epilepsy syndrome and look at, um, you know, what are their different seizure types. We might be saying they have an unexplained regression, but seizures are controlled. Are they having seizures at night? And then we actually do the EEG and instead we find the SES. Um, so there are many ways we identify them, um, and that heterogeneous that heterogeneity is probably also important, and those are different populations, basically, that it might mean a different thing in those different populations. So it's a great question. So anybody else? Sir? Let me see if I can bring up. It doesn't, uh, it's not allowing me to actually bring up the. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys very much.